Namaste. Welcome to another episode of Uladu Narpadu. Got it right this time. <laughs> so this episode is about the ego and how the ego forms and maintains itself. And surprisingly enough, it's exactly in agreement with the Buddha's teaching. What a wonder! This ghostly ego, which is devoid of form, that is, which has no form of its own, comes into existence by grasping a form, that is, by identifying the form of a body as I. It endures by grasping a form, that is, by continuing to cling to that body as I. It waxes more by grasping and feeding upon forms, that is, by attending to second and third person objects, which it cognizes through the five senses. Having left a form, it grasps a form, that is, having given up one body, it grasps another body as I. But if one searches for it by inquiring, who am I? this formless ego, it will take to flight, being found to be non-existent. No, thus. So we should know. <laughs> After watching all these videos, you know, you should know by now, right? You should know, and not just intellectually, not just by words but by experience, by looking into yourself, and by observing where does this ego arise? Where does it come from? How does it form? How does it maintain itself? And how does it disappear? The ego is a transient thing because its existence is dependent on other things. Try to understand. It cannot have real existence because it is always in relation with one or more forms. And of course, the principal form is the body. Uh, the body comes into existence at a certain stage. Therefore, it is also unreal. It is also just a dream. And then the ego grasps or clings to this body as I. So what is the ego? A dream within a dream. The world is a dream. The body is a dream. The ego is a dream. Yet people <laughs> spend so much time and energy trying to build up this ego by giving it more and more objects to feed on. We describe this process in detail in the episodes on the Mula Pariyaya, the root sequence of how the ego creates itself, or how the mind actually creates the ego by sleight of hand. Uh, did you ever watch a magician? Well, if you watch the magician from the point of view of the audience, you will never get to see how he does his tricks because he sets everything up very carefully to conceal the actual means by which he pulls a rabbit out of a hat or whatever. However, if you go backstage and you look through the curtain behind the magician, you can very easily see how he does his tricks. The hidden trap doors and the strings that he pulls and so on. Uh, where he stashes his extra deck of cards. <laughs> so in the same way, depending on our point of view, we can uh, actually see how the mind operates. If we take the point of view of the audience, <laughs> who want to be cheated, everybody knows a magician is cheating. There is no real magic in this world. Everything is explainable by the laws of physics. 
But because the magician is expert at misleading our attention to make us look over there when he's doing something over here. Therefore, he is able to cheat us. He's able to make it seem like he's doing the impossible. But if we, again, go behind the magician, where he hasn't prepared people to look, we can very easily see it's sleight of hand. He's got the card hidden up his sleeve, and he makes a certain motion with his hand, and it comes out. Isn't it? So depending on the point of view that we take, if we take the ordinary point of view where we're not critical of the ego, where we're not even suspecting the ego is doing anything wrong, then the ego will always be able to deceive us. We'll never see through it. Huh? Just like if we sit in front of the television all day, we might think that that's a window into a little room with all these little people running around. <laughs> but if we go around the back and take the cover off, we can see, oh, it's just a bunch of electronics. It's just an illusion, in other words. So in the same way, if we look at the ego from the angle of analytical intelligence, how is the ego functioning? How is it created? How is it maintained? We see that it's always dependent on grasping onto forms other than itself. It has no form. Huh? It's like a mirror, a mirror that can cling. And when some form comes in front of it that it likes, it assumes the shape of that form and then clings to it. Huh? This is my form. And because this is my form, well, then I must exist, right? <laughs> That's an inductive <laughs> conclusion. <laughs> That's like saying, because every swan we have ever seen is white, there are no black swans. Like saying that because every sheep that we have ever seen is white, there are no black sheep. But then one day we see a black swan or black sheep, and the whole illusion is destroyed. Inductive reasoning always leads to black swans and black sheep, because we are not seeing all the evidence. If we could see exactly how the mind operates, it could never deceive us. It could never let us think that there is an individual I, a separate being. Yet the whole civilization that we live in, its customs, its language, its literature, its school, its businesses, everything is predicated on the idea of a separate individual, an entity, an ego. An entity means an existence that has its own separate being. And an agent, someone who has agency, means an entity that can perform actions. So this is the ontology of illusion. This is the ontology of the material world. That every being is a separate individual ego who uh, is an entity, a self-existing being who has agency or the ability to act on his own. Now we know this is false. How do we know? Well, two things. The scriptures and the sages tell us so. And if we investigate even a little bit, we can see the truth of it for ourselves, in ourselves. We can see, for example, the sleight of hand that the mind uses to create the ego when there's actually nothing there at all. It's just information. It's just a picture on a screen. The, the mind is like the screen, and the ego is like some character who comes on the screen and talks and <laughs> does things and entertain us. 
So in the same way, in the screen of the mind, there is the image of the ego, which is the same as the image of this body. And then this body goes here and goes there and says this and does that. And then, oh, uh, here's the clicker. It creates karma. And we have to accept the results of that karma. We have to accept good and bad reactions, the consequences of our actions. Didn't bargain for that, did we? Oh, no. We just wanted some enjoyment, some nice sense enjoyment, or some power, or wealth, or fame, or beauty, or knowledge, or renunciation. So we go chasing after all these things. And even if we get them, we find that, number one, they're not perfect. Number two, they're not permanent. And number three, they give reactions. And some of these reactions are really nasty. Huh? Like having to take another body. When this body is finished, now the ego can't grasp it anymore. So what does it do? It runs off and creates another one. And we're going to get in the esoteric teaching series to a detailed explanation of exactly how that happens. It's going to be very interesting. A little bit intellectual, but I think in this case it's justified to, to give so much knowledge and form in words because it really shows us how the ego works, how the mind is creating these forms. Not that the mind lives in the body, uh -huh but that the body is created within the mind. The Anamaya Kosha, this material fleshy body, lives within the cocoon of the Manamaya Kosha, the mental sheath. Try to understand. Huh? And they live within the, the the Jnana Maya Kosha, and that lives within the Ananda Maya Kosha. Try to understand. This world that we see through the senses of the body lives within the body, and the body lives within the mind, and the mind lives within the intelligence, and the intelligence lives within what we might call the soul. So our ordinary view of life is just like the people who sit out in front, the audience at the magic show. Huh? They're getting entertained by the magician and they can never see how he does his tricks. But once we start listening to this teaching, once we start taking the point of view of the jnani, huh? the one who knows, then we can see, like going behind the curtain at the magic show, exactly how the mind does its tricks. And after that, it can never fool us anymore. We can never be entertained. Huh? Just like once we know how the magician does his tricks, he's not going to entertain us anymore. Because now we just think that, oh, he's a cynical rascal who's profiting off the ignorance of his audience. So in the same way, the mind is, is just another cynical rascal exploiting us, us being the self, the pure awareness within, and putting on this whole magic show of the body and the mind and all this stuff happening. But the price of admission is karma, being stuck in samsara, the wheel of birth and death. And in the succeeding episodes, and especially in the esoteric teaching series, we're going to go deep into exactly how this works. So just like once you know how a car engine works, then it can never mystify you. You could never think that it was magic huh? or a telephone or a TV. You could never think that they're magic because you know basically how they work. You know you could take one apart and fix it and put it back together again. And actually, we do this all the time. We actually know all these things deep down, but we forget them. They get covered over by the mind's tricks. 
So this teaching is all about how to remove those tricks, how to see through the indirection of the mind, how to penetrate the sleight of hand, the magic of the mind, and see the real truth. Oh, that's it. Oh, Harihi, oh.